prism. All right. And so, um, just going to read a little bit of the article in the news to get us all on the same track, track here. December 18th, Pope Francis officially signed a policy that allows Catholic priests to bless same-sex same-sex couples. While the move is not the same as approving same-sex unions or marriages within the church, it is nonetheless a radical change in Roman Catholic policy, which has historically considered and still does consider same-sex sexual relationships as sin. The declaration came from the Vatican's doctrine office and states in part, when people ask for a blessing, an exhaustive moral analysis should not be placed as a precondition for conferring it. For those seeking a blessing should not be required to have prior moral perfection. <clears throat> the declaration goes on to explain that a blessing offers people a means to increase their trust in God and adds... The request for a blessing thus expresses and nurtures openness to the transcendence, mercy, and closeness to God in a thousand concrete circumstances of life, which is no small thing in the world in which we live. Specifically, the priests may now bless the people within a same-sex relationship without blessing the relationship itself. The declaration speaks of the possibility of blessing couples in irregular situations and same-sex couples without officially validating their status or changing in any way the church's perennial teaching on marriage. And then if you go down uh, towards the end of that article, really the almost the last part or paragraph of the article, it says not all parts of the Roman Catholic Church have welcomed this permission to offer the blessing. And some conservative clerics have urged that the pronouncement be ignored. Some bishops have said they will not implement the new Vatican policy, and others have spoken strongly against it. Kazakh Bishop Athanasius Schneider, for example, who has long opposed Francis's progressive bent, called the new policy a great deception. Priests should be aware of, quote, the evil that resides in the very permission to bless couples in irregular situations and same-sex couples, he said. And then if you look at the applying the news story, I want to read a little bit of that too. It says there are two questions this lesson addresses. First, the news highlights the challenge of understanding and applying this policy declaration that seems to contradict itself. On the other hand, it says that church teaching has not changed regarding same-sex On the one hand, says that church teaching has not changed regarding same-sex marriage. On the other hand, it says priests can bless people in these same marriages that the church says are wrong. Second, the news prov provides a way to talk about how church teachings evolve over time and what, by contrast, should never change. The basic question is, who gets to decide what the church teaches as truth? Um, Yeah, so let's go to the big question. <clears throat> so question one says, what statements in the above description of the policy declaration by Pope Francis seem contradictory? So as you look through that, you know, news story, <clears throat> what statements seem contradictory to you? Anything to suggest your inappropriate relationship. You got a bandwidth of extremes. They're, they're going this one direction. Well, we're not going to support the same sex marriage, but we're going to bless this couple. Now, I can see blessing them as an individual, mm -hmm. but why include the word couple? Yeah, 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 yeah. Other things that you saw there that were like, it's just. Don't fit together. Talks about how giving him a blessing is a means to increase their trust mm -hmm. in God. Mm -hmm. 
And they're not there. <laughs> mm -hmm. You know, they're not trusting God. They mm -hmm. just want, they just don't want to feel guilty. Well, yeah, but it, you know, the, what the blessing is supposedly for doesn't seem to fit the people that they're right. the blessing. Right. Those two things don't seem right. to go together very well. Yeah. What about the second half of that question? <clears throat> what statements raise questions in your mind about how this policy declaration fits with what the Bible says? So let's look at those passages. First, First Corinthians 6, 9 through 11. Somebody's got that to read. I don't know if we got all of the... So I went and got that last. Okay. 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 Do you not know that the wicked will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither the sexually immoral, nor idol idolaters, nor adulterers, nor male prostitutes, not homosexual offenders, nor thieves, nor the greedy, not drunken, not drunkenards, not slanders, not swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. And that is what some of you were. But you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ by the Spirit of our God. All right. And then let's look at the other one uh, from First, First Timothy, <clears throat> chapter 1, verses 8 through 11. <clears throat> now we know that the law is good. If one uses it lawfully, understanding this, that the law is not laid down for the just, but for the lawless and the disobedient, for the ungodly and sinners, for the unholy and profane, for those who strike their fathers and mothers, for murderers, the sexually immoral, men who practice homosexuality, enslavers, liars, perjurers, and whatever else is contrary to sound doctrine in accordance with the gospel of the glory of the blessed God with which I have been entrusted. Thanks. So <clears throat> what statements in that pronouncement by the Pope raise questions in your minds about how this policy declaration fits with what the Bible says? In Corinthians, you know, it says that, and, and so were such of you, so were you, mm -hmm. yeah. but they weren't still in those sins. Right. Such were some of you, but yeah. you were yeah. well, what you were sanctified. Yeah. And so there was a change right. that happened. Right. And so it's not... You know, okay. you've never done anything wrong or you're so perfect and holy that God loves you, but it's that you're forgiven mm -hmm. and you've received God's grace. Yeah? I have a hard time with this subject. I, I mean, it's like, I think of myself, I, I just think like, except for the, but for the grace mm -hmm. of God, go I, mm -hmm. uh, I mean, I'm a, not attracted to the male um, but I somehow, I, you know, people that are attracted to the same sex, I just don't feel like it's like something just got miswired or something. But, but according to the word, you know, it's it's um, I guess maybe practicing your homosexual mm -hmm. right, tendencies mm -hmm. is mm -hmm. right. Yeah. I mean, I have to, well, I mean, I guess I don't have to. I mean, the Lord has blessed me with his grace. I mean, I'm going to fail in a lot of different sins. But but um, my goal is to refrain from sexual lust. And I think whether you're attracted to a male or a female, your goal should be to refrain from mm -hmm. sexual lust. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Unless you're married. Right. But, 
but then you know <laughs> very now, <laughs> now, yeah yeah my bible says one man one woman yes yes yeah um, yeah I, I think that's one of the things that's important to bring in to this discussion you know is you know there are clear passages in the bible that talk about homosexual behavior being sin just like there are clear biblical passages that talk about adultery being sin or about other kinds of you know theft is sin and you know there are very clear passages about doing this activity taking this action is sinful so you know there are clear statements about that in the bible regarding homosexual behavior but to recognize a part of what we need to bring in is how God created human beings. You know, what is God's design? What is his plan? And we need to go back to Genesis chapters 1 and 2 and say, you know, God created man and woman. And God brought the woman to the man and they were married. And so what is God's design? What is God's plan? How did God create things? That's how it is. Mm -hmm. And so <clears throat> it's it's hard because sin entered yeah. the world and you messed all yes. that up. Yeah. And yeah. whether it's learned or mm -hmm. or a natural tendency just because mm -hmm. of sin mm -hmm. that doesn't make it okay right right um you know the huge majority of cases of homosexual behavior transgender behavior there are things in that person's life from childhood Mm -hmm. that have been a factor in that. And so, you know, there should be sympathy right. and recognition of, right. you know, this person didn't choose this. You know, this is something that happened to them. Um, but again, that doesn't mean it's okay, biblically. So, I guess the other part of it, me too, personally, is that I don't really have a, any friends that are mm. gay. Um, I never have. I mm -hmm. no, it just mm. hasn't mm -hmm. happened. Mm -hmm. So uh, I guess I'm, you know, trying to speak from a outside yeah. <laughs> box. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. I've got a couple of neighbors that are gay, and I, but. When they became Christians, they gave it up. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know? Wow. So, oh, wow. That is. You know, we talked about at the afternoon study, um, one of the speakers at the fly convention this summer was Christopher Elon, who, you know, lived a gay lifestyle for many years and had a dramatic conversion experience. And but he talks about the fact that you know he still struggles with that same sex attraction, but he knows that's that doesn't define who he is. He's defined by Jesus, his relationship to Christ, and you know that's a struggle and a challenge, and he needs to work through that always. But it's the behavior. That is right. sinful, right? Not right. that it's the old no. saying, love the sinner or hate the sin. Mm -hmm. yeah. 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. And so, there are all those issues that should be brought in. You know, it's it's true, you know, and like question two kind of gets into what we're talking about too. Is it possible for a Christian to bless a person who is choosing to live in a situation that's contradictory to Christian teaching? And you know. To bless a person, you know, we need to treat everybody 
with love and respect and every individual is valued by God, you know, as a human being, somebody that Jesus came to die for, they're created by God. But can we, you know, can a Christian bless a person who is choosing to live in a way that contradicts Christian teaching? Or should a person, or should a Christian bless well, a person? Well, yeah. yeah. Does that does that benefit a person? person to bless them i mean well that's part of the question is what is a blessing yeah you know yeah, yeah like i was trying to kind of get that out of this too of what the pope said mm -hmm. or else maybe this is just an explanation of what the pope said but the request for a blessing expresses and nurtures openness to the transcendence mercy and closeness to god i i think when we sin we don't draw closer to god we are putting a separation you know yeah. and so i don't know this just seems like a contradiction to me mm -hmm. kind of where yeah. um you're if you're blessing something that's contradictory to what god has said he mm -hmm. commands mm -hmm. then I don't know how it can be a blessing. <laughs> right. I don't know. Right. That's, that's, the, that's so, the thing that's yeah. a challenge. Yeah. What are you what are you doing here? Yeah. You know, what what is that? But here, think about this. When I mean, you think about this question, you know, is it possible for a Christian to bless a person who is choosing to live in a situation that's contradictory to Christian teaching? On the Sundays, usually, if I'm preaching at the end of the service. I will pronounce a benediction, a blessing, a blessing on the congregation. Is it possible that there are people sitting in that congregation that are living, that are choosing to live in a situation that's contradictory to Christian teaching? Mm -hmm. So should I quit pronouncing the blessing? Mm -hmm. Am I doing something wrong mm -hmm. by doing that? How do we, you know, we look at this and go, this doesn't seem right. How do we reconcile pronouncing a benediction at the end it, of the it, church service? This is with the knowledge. Okay. And you're... Uh, yeah, I don't know. You don't know what, what people mean. are doing. Yeah. What about the idea of pronouncing a blessing or blessing a person? I was going to ask about that too. Is <laughs> like, can we bless a person? I thought the only God can bless a person. Sure. Yeah, yeah. You know, and we so can ask God to bless. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I don't know that. Yeah, yeah. Part of the part of the challenge here is, and the, I think one of the reasons this is difficult for us to get our minds around is there is a difference in understanding what a blessing is from what we do, how we would understand it, to what the Roman Catholic yeah, would understand. Yeah, yeah. I was going to say that because with with Roman Catholicism. <clears throat> The blessing, along with you know the sacraments in general, baptism, the Lord's Supper, the other five sacraments they have, they would say that those things bring God's grace by default, kind of. That it happens. God, they that person receives God's grace. It just comes to them by the priest pronouncing the words. Whereas we would say the word of God offers grace to the person, but it's not effective unless it's received in faith. It doesn't do anything unless there's faith to receive the blessing. And so, you know, I can stand up front and say the Lord bless you. But the person who's sitting in the pew who's going, I don't, I'm going to live my life the way I want to. I don't care what God thinks about it. They're saying, I don't want that blessing, you know, and, and so they don't get any benefit from it. And so that's one of the differences, too, is what a blessing is, how it works, um, makes a difference. You bring up a good subject, too, I guess, is the Catholic Church. I mean, comparing what the Catholic Church doctrine might be, which I don't know, you know, but I know it's for rumors. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it doesn't, I don't know if it's something that 
well, it's another sin, but you may have a gay couple or whatever came here to church. Mm -hmm. You wouldn't care, would you? No, we'd love to have them come. I mean, we want to hear like God's it. word. Right. Yeah. Yeah. We want God, God's word to work. And so, you know, that's why part of this is challenging is, yes, we do want to show God's love to everybody. We want to treat everybody with kindness and respect, you know, as God's creation. And yet we don't want to encourage or say their sin doesn't matter. Yeah. You know, and again, that's part of the deal too is, you know, there's a difference between a person who struggles with a particular sin but recognizes it's wrong and wants to change and a person who commits a sin and doesn't believe it's a sin and doesn't have any desire to change. And today, he's imposing his views on the rest of us. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, yeah, the person's heart makes a difference too, mm -hmm. and how they look at it, how they receive it. You know, I blessings like what um, Jacob did for let's see, Esau, and I get these people. What Isaac did? Isaac for did for Jacob, Jacob? and Esau. Yeah. You know, and and. They they tricked him, mm -hmm. lied about really getting a blessing, mm -hmm. and yet they mm -hmm. he got a blessing. But that was a whole different type of blessing. Well, there were different circumstances there, and it, it it's challenging. It's a challenging cir circumstance. But you know, you got a couple of things going on. One is part of what they were doing were was kind of legal business. Okay. Who gets yeah. the inheritance? Okay. And part of it is God had already told both Isaac and Sarah who was supposed to get the blessing. And Isaac was going to do his own thing, yeah. even though he knew Jacob was the one who was supposed to get blessed. And so when he oh, did that, and you know, all the way around. It was. But you know, that was part of Isaac saying, I can't take that blessing away, was he knew that's what God wanted to happen. Yeah. And so he was like, okay, I guess I got, I got his way anyway. Yeah. <laughs> so there were there's lots of things going on there that are yeah. involved. Yeah. yeah. Look at question three. <clears throat> so how does your church define truth? In what sense is Christ the truth in all? Christian faith groups. So thinking especially about in the article, um, I find that statement. <clears throat> uh, no, it was it's in the, the applying the news story. And the second paragraph, the end of that paragraph asks, the basic question is, who gets to decide yeah. what the church teaches yeah. as truth? Yeah. So, well, I was thinking, it's no body that gets to decide. Okay. It's God. That's, we just have to follow him. Yeah. Yeah. And that's, that's, I think, a big part of the challenge with this is the way that the, this is written and, you know, the implications of some of the things that are said, it's like, you know, the church, the leader of the church, this council or whatever is, has the authority to decide what truth is or what isn't in terms of Christianity. And we would say, yeah, that's one no. Yeah. 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 And it, and his word. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. let's read yeah. that passage, uh, 2 Timothy 3, verses 16 and 17, which we looked at recently. 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17, all scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for proof, for correction, and for training in righteousness that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. And so, you know, it's, it's you know, who has the ability to who gets to decide what the church teaches as truth like you said nobody does 
God is the only one mm -hmm. that can say what is true. Yeah. And there, I mean, the crazy things people believe in right now, mm -hmm. there is no truth out there. Right. there that you can't even right. use scientific evidence. Of. Yeah. They just ignore it. Mm -hmm. We have a Supreme Court justice member that can't define oh. the definition of a law. Yeah, woman. right. Right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's just... But, you know, the thinking here even is, you know, it's it's backwards. You know, the church is God's church. Mm -hmm. the, you know, the way this question is written, it assumes it's like God is the church is God. The, the church decides what who God is mm -hmm. and what he's like. Yeah. And, you know, that turns yeah. things around yeah. completely. And that's when we get into trouble. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. So I don't, I don't know if any of you noticed this or you know thought about this, um, but in the article um, on, in the applying the news story section, kind of in the middle of that section, it talks about you know every Christian denomination has a list of beliefs, and you know these are found in you know the doctrines or confession of faith or articles of faith or so on. And then that next paragraph talks about, you know, in the middle of that, it says, for example, some denominations from the reform background may have statements about predestination that are not present in any significant way on the current list. Likewise, some groups from the Wesleyan tradition may have faith statements about sanctification, also called holiness or the second blessing, that are absent from more recent, the more recent list or mentioned only nominally. nominally. And so again, you know, the implication is churches are changing their doctrines all the time. Okay. Yeah, you know, oh, it's just so simple. And <laughs> you know, Jesus said he's between yesterday, yeah. today, and tomorrow. Yeah. And it's the same with God's word. It's yeah. as good now as yes. it was for the last thousands of years. And it's that simple. Yeah. And all this doctrine and blah, you know, <laughs> don't have to Get into all of that yeah, stuff. Just yeah. read the word and yeah, see what yeah. it says. Yeah. I mean, yeah, that doesn't change. Yeah. Doctrines, anything man oriented or, or yeah, yeah. yeah. that changes constantly yeah. because we're just so yeah. But it it was interesting to me reading that statement. And you know, so I'm interested in this and have some background with it. And so I wanted to look and see. And so, you know, the implication is these churches are changing their doctrine all the time. But, so I went and looked at the website for the NAS, which is from the Wesleyan tradition. And I know that <clears throat> the Nazarene church has kind of pulled back a little bit from some of the emphasis on sanctification, holiness, the second blessing. I was like, I wonder, have they changed what they believe? And so I went and looked on their website. And sure enough, <clears throat> there's a doctrinal statement, you know, at the end of that doctrinal statement, which is really very, you know, the main things you know, the very basic things that you believe, that's what's there. But at the end of that, there's a link that says, you know, if you want to know more about these things, click here. So you click there, and it takes you to the national. Yeah. Well, it takes you the rabbit hole. But it takes you to the, you know, the national Church of the Nazarene website. And on their website, that doctrinal statement, it has all of this stuff. Mm -hmm. That so this implies, and so you know they're not emphasizing it as much anymore, they but they haven't changed their doctrine. Oh, they haven't. No, no. And so it's just interesting that there are churches that have changed their doctrine, and it's significant and it makes a difference. But you know, evangelical, most evangelical Protestant churches. You know, they might not emphasize some of those distinctives as much as they did at one point, but they haven't changed what they believe. 
And so it just, it was interesting to recognize that. You know, the, the next paragraph there, the existence of revised doctrinal lists remind us that with many faith communities, theology is seen as dynamic and responsive to a changing world. Hmm. A motto in the United Church of Christ is God is still speaking with the idea that God is changing uh, what he said. And we'd say, no, that isn't true. And so there are churches that are doing that. But, you know, the conservative Protestant churches oh. are not. Okay. And so that's an interesting thing to, to notice. Um, there's a difference from, you know, the, the liberal to the conservative. Mm -hmm. So hmm. um, we should read that section uh, from Jude, verses two and or verses three and four. So I think that's a healthy uh, thing to make sure we recognize when we're looking at this subject. So Jude three and four, somebody's got that. Beloved, <laughs> beloved, while I was making every effort to write you about our common salvation, I felt the necessity to write to you, a, to write to you appealing that you contend earnestly for the faith which was once for all delivered to the saints. For certain persons have crept in unnoticed, those who were long beforehand marked out for this condemnation, ungodly persons who turn the grace of our God into licentiousness and deny our only master and Lord Jesus Christ. Thanks. And so it talks about the context of the letter. You know, Jude was going to write a letter about the salvation we share, but then he changes his mind and decides he needs to write about telling them to contend for the faith. And that phrase that he uses, this faith that was delivered once and for all. Mm -hmm. And the reason that he had to do that was these false teachers had come in. And, you know, this context is very much like what we're talking about in this subject. They had changed their teaching because they wanted to say, you can live however you want. We're free, you know? And Jude says, no, you can't live however you want. And so just to recognize that, but the, the question that uh, comes up at the end, what is the content of the faith that was once for all handed on to God's people. You know, that phrase that Jude uses uh, to contend for the faith that was once for all delivered to the saints. What is the content of the faith that Jude is referring to there? What would you say? The scripture. Yeah. God's word. Jesus' teaching, the teaching of the apostles. And so just to recognize, you know, really what an amazing thing this is. Because, you know, people will talk about or try to talk about how, you know, Christianity developed. And the church debated and then decided on what teachings they would agree with or not. And there were other parts of the church that wanted other things to be recognized as the truth, but this was the majority vote or the ones that had power. And so, you know, the church came up with doctrine and teaching. <laughs> but this here, you know, within a generation of Jesus, before the New Testament was finished, Jude could refer to the faith that was once and for all delivered to the saints. Mm -hmm. So already it was decided. You know, they weren't deciding or debating about what teachings we should believe. It was what is the faith that has always been taught. And that phrase, the faith, is used over and over and over again in the New Testament. And so just to, you know, to, to know, nobody figured out what, you know, what is true. It was always, let's make sure we hold to mm. the truth 
that came from Jesus. So when they picked out the Bi the books of the Bible that were mm -hmm. going to be included mm -hmm. in yeah. our Bible, um, you know that uh, how did that how does that work out? And, and again, I think that that kind of language is misleading. You know, picked out which books were going to be included. And God kind of. Well, yes, God oversaw the whole process, but the question was never, hmm, which books should we include in the Bible? Or that which books should we not? Include? No, the question was, which books have always been recognized oh. as biblical? Okay. Which are the ones that everybody has always known okay. were the ones that were inspired by God? So it was some of these side ones that... Were left out simply because they weren't the ones that yes. were always the yes. best. Yeah, and so it was, you know, everybody knew Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and John were the Gospels. Mm. But then, you know, a hundred years later, here oh, comes yeah. somebody who says, hey, I got the Gospel of Peter. We should put that one in there, too. And they go, hmm, no. There isn't a gospel of Peter. Mm -hmm. These are the gospels. That's what we know. And so, you know, the way that it's worded often misleads in terms of understanding how that works. Because mm -hmm. they were simply recognizing what had been seen and understood from the beginning. Mm -hmm. From Jesus, from the original apostles. Wait, it's a miracle. Yeah, it is. It is. Let's look at these other scriptures too. So Philippians 2, verses 12 and 13. So we've got that. Yeah, I've got that. Dearest friends, when I was there with you, you were always so careful to follow my instructions. And now that I am away, you must be even more careful to do the good things that result from being saved, obeying God with deep reverence, shrinking back from all that might displease him. For God is at work within you, helping you want to obey him, and then helping you do what he wants. I'm right. sure that's a lot different well, than anybody else has. <laughs> the, no, the, the, the um, article, the comment here, I think is so interesting. This passage contains a well-known line, work out or work on your own salvation with fear and trembling, which is misapplied by some to mean Decide for yourself what you should believe. Oh. Yeah. So the, the question that comes up is, so how do we work out our salvation? I thought God did the work of salvation. So what is Paul talking paraphrase. about here? I thought what my paraphrase said. So how, how did it say it again? And now that I am away, you must be even more careful to do the good things that result from being saved, yeah. obeying God with deep reverence, shrinking back from all that might displease him. Yeah, that result from. You do saved. what results from being saved, not you do this to get saved. Right. right. Yeah. And so that, yeah, I like that. That is a good, good way to put it. That's and the question is what part of salvation is up, up to God and what part is up to you? It's all up to God. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's up to us. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> we need to take this out. Yeah. 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 You know, and, 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 you know, we, we know that Paul isn't saying there's part of salvation that we need to do because of what he says elsewhere. Mm -hmm. If you just look ahead to chapter 3, verse 9, for example, of Philippians, or verses 8 and 9, maybe, Paul says, Indeed, I count everything as lost because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake I've suffered the loss of all things and count them as nothing, in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith. And so again, very clear, Paul's not saying, I got to do something to get saved. You know, we simply receive that gift that God gives to us. And then, you know, it can't be, you know, decide for yourself what you should believe. 
But that's, but that's what they do. Uh, yeah. That's how it is yep. now. Yeah. That is what they do. Yeah. And then, then let's look at the Philippians 2, verses 5 through 11. So just before these verses, somebody's got that. Help this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God, the thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, and then death on the cross. Therefore, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. I think so. Question is, what doctrinal points about Jesus are contained in this passage? What are the things that that one little section teaches us about Jesus, who he is, what he's done? Do that. Oh, okay. Question well, says God exalted him even more highly and gave him the name that is above every name. Yeah, so Jesus is exalted, he is God, you know, he is in that position, demands complete obedience, he's the Lord of all. What else do we see here? What does it teach us about who Jesus is, about what he's done? Well, he was born in the likeness of me. Mm -hmm. So he became a human being. He took on a human nature. He's a true man. Uh, he's also God. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. He existed as the eternal God. He's true God. So true God, true man. And then what did he do? He laid all that is left. Yeah. yeah. And obedient to death. Died on the cross, taking the judgment for our sin, and then rose again, and God then raised him to the highest place. So all of that, you know, teaching about who Jesus is in that one little passage of scripture. Hmm. Yeah. Um and then one or two. Find it. Yeah, go back to question five. <clears throat> How much, if at all, did your church's doctrinal statement affect your decision to attend that church? What would you say? Well, I did look for sure. <laughs> okay. I did. No yeah. Mm. I have to say, I, I don't know beans about doctrine, you know, and I guess if I read a doctrinal statement, though, I'd get a pretty good idea of what's oh, going on. But hopefully. I think when we were looking again mm -hmm. for a church because we didn't like what we saw, what was happening at our old church, and I think we were looking for a church that taught the Bible mm -hmm. as the truth, mm -hmm. the word of God, that's you know, we were on the same page about who Jesus was, mm -hmm. what he did for our sins, and I, I don't know that I knew much about the doctrine, the really. Doctor, we researched the in-practice doctrine. Mm -hmm. well, we, sure. uh, I've been here to Calgary a couple times to get in. Sure. Knew who the people were, knew what their underlying mm -hmm. faith was, um, and it was a Bible-based church. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that little that that's the key. doctrine, but we saw the doctrine in practice. That was the key too for me. Then Bible-based church. Yeah. If you have a Bible-based church, your drop doctrine should be pretty in line. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 But you know, it's interesting that you know, probably, you know, the church's doctrinal statement for most people probably isn't. You know, right up there at the top of the reason why they choose the church. Right. You, know, probably, you know, but like you said, Jim, you know, you look because if there's something wrong there, you know, you want to know that. Right. Yeah. So, it, you know, it can show you if there's a problem right away. Um, but then, like you say, you want to see how it works out in practice, what it really looks like. That, that's important, too. And then... Should people be able to belong to a faith community before they believe all its doctrines? I thought that was an interesting question. 
Well, I I think in some ways that's true because I know not everybody who worships together with us in church is um, convinced about uh, infant baptism. No. But yeah. we can still worship we yeah. can, because yeah. that isn't yeah, that isn't so it, you know to me it's you know a lot of it to me is how do you define these things? Should people be able to belong to a faith community? So with many people, there's a difference between you know being part of the church and being an official member on the roster. You know, there's a significant number of people right. at Calvary who, are, who are part of the church yeah. uh -huh. but aren't members. And, that's, and so for that's some true. of them, you know, that's a reason is yeah. I don't agree with everything. Right. So I don't want to, you know, say that I do, but I still believe this is where God yeah. wants me to be and to be part of that church. And so, you know, to belong or to be officially on the list of members there's a difference there and then you know before they believe all its doctrines and there's a difference between you know the main doctrines the foundational right, right. big things and the secondary doctrines yeah and again you know people who believe those main things <clears throat> you know that's great we're all together, even though there might be differences about some of the same. When we all die and go to heaven, we're all going to know. Yeah. Yeah. We'll, we'll yeah. get it figured out. <laughs> we'll, we'll find out. Yes. You know. Yeah. But, you know, that's part of the struggle that there is in our world today. How do we, how do we, you know, one of the arguments is, you know, how can you say you know what the truth is, you know what the right teaching is when all of these churches have all these different teachings. You know, how can you claim that you know? And, you know, the implication is that there's no way to know the truth and then it's like, you know, there really isn't truth. You know, we can't define truth. We can't get it nailed down. So there really isn't truth. And, you know, I would say, no, it's not that there isn't truth. It's just that we as human beings, because of our limitations of our knowledge and our sin nature and all of those things, we struggle to understand and know all of the truth. We might get something wrong, yeah. Yeah. but... There is a truth. Right. We just went through the book of Daniel. <laughs> and, and it's like, oh man, that's hard. Really, really hard. Yeah. But I, I, I look, I, there's a verse in Proverbs somewhere in it. It says, if you search for wisdom as for gold and mm -hmm. silver, and, and you will find wisdom. And so to me, it's like, you got to dig, dig, yes. dig, dig, yeah. dig. Yeah. yeah, the more you dig, the more you That's understand. It. Yeah, but so we we admit, yes, we are limited as human beings, and the Bible the Bible says we're limited yeah. by telling us we need to serve. Yes, yeah, you know? but the fact that we're limited and that we're imperfect and that I can't claim that I guarantee that what I believe about some of these doctrines is right, I can say. There is a right. Mm -hmm. You know, God knows what is right and wrong and true and false and good and bad. And so there is truth. I need to seek that and try to find it and know it as best as I can. And I can, I need to have some humility and recognize, okay, I could be wrong. About this. You know, maybe you are right. Um, but somebody is right. Because God knows and has truth. There is truth. Yeah, we just struggle to find it no, for sure sometimes. So but I just yeah. I just think how confusing it has to be for people 
when there is no truth in their body. Mm, yeah. You know, when it can change depending mm -hmm. on who, yeah. So it just yeah. it would feel you feel so in limbo and no solid ground underneath you. This is going to be an interesting year with the election. <laughs> oh, and, and, it's, <laughs> and it's like it's like, you know, we gotta look that way, not yeah. towards Washington DC yeah. or ABC or CBS or Fox yeah. or yeah. we gotta look that way. And it but it's you know, it's a challenge because we're you know, we're bombarded by it, we're it's all around us. It's the subject of everything. And it's just hard not to get overwhelmed yeah. by the politics of an election year like this. And, you know, opinions are so strong. And yeah, it just, but it, it you know, this is, a, this is a test for us to say, you know, what do I really trust in? You know, what is the foundation? And, you know, can I, live my life and find peace and joy and grace in Christ despite all of this stuff that's going on around me. Um, and it's a challenge to do that. Mm -hmm. But that's well, getting out of Minneapolis sure helps. <laughs> <laughs> I believe that. <laughs> so. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you that you have, in such amazing ways, given us your word that we can rely on and count on and know is true. I thank you that you did send Jesus to be our Savior, who is the word and who is the way and the truth and the light. Lord, thank you that we have these things that are a solid foundation. Help us to rest on these things and not get pulled away or help us with the things that we struggle with, our sins and the things that pull us away from faith in you. And Lord, help us to see the people around us with your love and your grace, not as enemies, but as people who you love and care for, and so often people that are held captive and in bondage by sin and Satan. Lord, help us to demonstrate your love in Jesus to those we encounter too. And give us grace uh, to see people the way that you do. But Lord, thank you for your word and your truth. Thank you for this time for each one that could be here. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you very much. Glad we'll to work through this one. <laughs> it's a challenge. Yeah. I'm going to